said, Gus. <clears throat> All right, if you would, take your Bibles tonight. Turn to Exodus chapter 20. <clears throat> and I am going to go until I get to the end or my voice leaves me. All right, so uh, it may be a short message or it may be a complete message. We'll, we'll see how it goes. <clears throat> It is a short verse that we're going to be looking at tonight from Exodus chapter 20. It's one of the Ten Commandments, <clears throat> and it's only four words, and it's found in verse 13. So look at verse 13. It says, Thou shalt not kill. You know, there's all kinds of killing around us going on all the time, isn't there? I mean, everywhere you look, just look at the headlines on the internet, just watch the news, I hope you probably don't, each night, and you will see there's all kinds of killing. There's men killing men, there's women killing their children, <clears throat> there's children killing their parents, there's people walking into places and blowing places up and shooting people and all kinds of killing going on today. And the list just kind of goes on and on. But God says very plainly in his word, thou shalt not kill. <clears throat> in the Hebrew language, the commandment actually reads, thou shalt do no murder. Thou shalt do no murder. Well, here God is establishing something very plain, a foundational principle of life, and this is what it is. Life is precious. It is precious. And the reason that life is precious is because of the source of life. The Bible clearly teaches that God is the source of life. He is the giver of life. And it is God alone who brings life into existence. <clears throat> There's basically two theories when it comes to life. We all probably know at least to some degree about these two theories. There's the evolutionary theory. And basically, if you believe in evolution tonight, you put human beings on the same level as animals. That's basically what evolution does. If you believe in creationism tonight, you believe that every human life is precious. Why? Because God was the creator of that life. And it's only God who has the right to take away life. Now, the point of this commandment in front of us is that life is to be taken very seriously because God is the source of that life. God takes life seriously. You know, some of the commandments that, that we have here, you can break these commandments and you can kind of go back and kind of make restitution for those commandments. I mean, if you break the commandment, thou shalt not steal, I can, if I stole something from you, I can go back to you later on and I can ask for your forgiveness. I can repent of that sin <clears throat> and I can try to my best to repay you or replace whatever it was that I uh, stole from you. But this is one of those commandments that you can't undo because once you take a life from someone, you cannot go back and give that life back again. So this is a very serious commandment. To some folks, life means very little. I mean, we've seen that in recent days with names like Saddam Hussein or Osama bin Laden or Fidel Castro or Vladimir Putin. I mean, none of these guys value life very much. I remember reading about Napoleon Bonaparte who was making plans for a great battle and one of his assistants came to him and they said, uh, Sir, if we go to battle, if we wage this war, it will cost us 100,000 men. Napoleon Bonaparte looked at his assistant and he said, 100,000 men, what is that to me? It just kind of shows you the value that he put upon life. This commandment clearly forbids some things. and We're going to look at those things tonight. But for some, they have twisted, they have taken this commandment and they've twisted it and they've made it mean what it doesn't mean, what God never intended it to mean. And so we're going to look at those things first what this commandment does not forbid. I want you to notice, first of all, it does not forbid the killing of animals. And let me say we ought to always be humane in how we treat animals. I don't think we ought to abuse animals, mistreat animals in any way. But there are activists today who will actually quote this verse from the Bible and they'll say, see, God says you ought not to kill animals. 
Well, that's not what God says at all. Matter of fact, in this very same chapter, in verse 24, God gave the instructions concerning the sacrifice of animals. In Genesis chapter 9, verse 3, God said, Every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Now, I don't know how an animal can be meat for you unless you kill it first, right? You got to kill a cow before you eat it. Now, I've known some people to eat parts of cow, and it looked like it was still mooing, all right? But you usually got to kill the animal before you eat it. God gave us that right to do that. So if you want to become a vegetarian tonight, by all means, become a vegetarian. But don't use this verse to back up your position because that's not what God is saying. I read about a man who was arrested for shooting a California condor. And he was taken before the judge who happened to be an animal activist. And everybody knew that this judge was going to throw the book at him. He was going to lock him away, give him as much time as possible. And so the judge said to the man, you've killed a rare bird, and my duty is clear. But before I give you your sentence, do you have anything to say? And so the man said, yes, I do, Your Honor. He said, you see, my, my family and I, we were in a bad way. We didn't have anything to eat. And I lost my job. And, and I'm too proud to ask the government for help. I didn't know where else to turn, and so I saw this bird, and I killed it, and that's what we ate. It was the first thing we had eaten in like two weeks. But lo and behold, this judge had compassion on him. And he said, I understand, and I feel sorry for you. And he said, I could lock you away. I could find you a big fine, but because you killed this bird in order to eat it to survive, I'm going to let you go. And he let him go. And just as the man was about to turn around to leave the courtroom, the judge asked the man, he said, Sir, I do have one more question before you leave today. What does California condor taste like? And the man said, Well, it's not as sweet as the spotted owl and not as tough as the bald eagle. Now, some people don't know when to stop, right? <laughs> they probably should have kept quiet a little longer, but... There is a difference between the quality of an animal and a human being. God has placed great value on the human being. Genesis 2, 7 says, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You don't find that anywhere else in the Bible where God did that to an animal. The last part of that verse says, And a man became a living soul. You don't find anywhere in the Bible where it says an animal has a soul. And so God place great, places great, extreme value on human beings. Nowhere do we find that God breathed the breath of life into an animal. The Bible also says that man was made in the image of God. You don't find where it says that about an animal either. So, first of all, it doesn't forbid the killing of animals. Secondly, the commandment does not forbid capital punishment. The only one who has the right to take away life is the one who gave life. Would you agree that? God is the only one who has the right to give people the right to take another's life. He is only, and he has set some strict guidelines in his word of times that that may be necessary. Notice what his word says, Exodus 21, verse 12. He that smiteth a man so that he die shall be surely put to death what does that sound like to you that's capital punishment genesis 9 6 whoso sheddeth man's blood by man shall his blood be shed for in the image of god made he man again another verse that speaks explicitly about capital punishment romans 13 says legitimate government can carry out executions under the right circumstances listen to what it says romans 13 1 let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. In other words, the governments don't have any power unless God gives them power. That's what that verse is saying. And then verse 4 says, For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid. For he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God, a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. So God has given power, 
has given that authority to those in charge to carry out capital punishment. Folks, those are, basic, those are verses basically that have been cast aside in America today. It's no longer carried out swiftly or consistently. I read this this past week. Only 1 in 1,000 murderers are executed. 1 in 1,000. And that's only after a decade or even more of appeal. 70% of all violent crimes are committed by 7% of male criminals. Now you say, that just, that's funny math. That doesn't add up. How is that possible? It's because the same men keep committing the same crimes over and over and over and over again. And nothing is done about it. So the government comes up with this brilliant idea, three strikes, and you're out. That's kind of like telling your child, all right, I'm giving you the count of ten to do what I told you to do. Now, you're losing the battle when you do that. The Bible says one strike, you're out. The National Center for uh, Policy Analysis in Dallas, Texas, released a report a few years ago saying that the average prison stay for murders in America is 1.8 years. The average is 1.8 years. That means there are some that are let out in less time in less than two years for killing somebody. I, I, I came across these numbers. This is kind of unrelated. Rapist spends 60 days on average. Arson, 23 days. Folks, criminal, career criminals are laughing at our justice system in America. You realize that, right? And, and they don't fear God, and they don't fear the law, and they don't fear you and me. And what does our society blame? The violent problem that we have in America is because of poverty, racism, and lack of education. How ridiculous. I've got a better explanation. How about a sin nature? How about, how about folks are just making poor choices based on their sin nature? Because it all comes down to this one thing. Do we do things God's way or do we do things our way? The third thing that this commandment does not forbid is self-defense. Exodus 22 verse 2 says, If a thief be found breaking up and be smitten that he die, there shall no blood be shed for him. In other words, according to the Bible, if somebody breaks into your home and is threatening your life or your family's life, you have the right to shoot him. All right, you have that right. Now, I know that's not popular today, all right? And by the way, if you do shoot him, God does not consider that to be murder. There's a difference. I like the sign I saw one time in someone's front yard. It had a picture of a gun on it, and it said this, forget the dog, beware the owner. I like that. Fair warning, right? But do you realize that the agenda of the liberal crowd today is to take the guns away from the law-abiding citizen? Matter of fact, they're fighting that war right now. Almost every day in Congress, they're going back and forth with that. Every time there's a shooting somewhere, it's brought back up to the headlines. Look, when somebody breaks into your home, they're not there to wish you well. They're not there to do you good. And when you outlaw citizens from having guns, the only people with guns will be the outlaws. And so it does not forbid self-defense. You have the right to defend yourself. This commandment does not forbid the declaration of war. Now the key is making sure that the reason for that war is just and noble. And of course we've had some presidents in the past who have used those very same words to describe wars that did not fall into that category. But war is a terrible thing. I think we can all agree on that, can we not? It's awful. No one in their right mind wants to go to war, but there are some things worse than war, like losing your freedom. There are some things worth fighting for. And the Bible permits and in many cases commands us to go to war. Let me give you two examples of the same person's life. I think of David in the Old Testament. There were times where God told David, Go to war with those folks. You go fight against that, those folks. The enemies of Israel. God gave the command. God condoned it. God blessed him for going to war against Israel's enemy. But then you remember the time when David told his captain to put Uriah up at the front, the hottest part of the battle? God did not condone that. Matter of fact, God was upset with David about that whole thing. Why? Because David's trying to cover up his sin. He's trying to murder, and there was a difference. It was murder at that point. All right, so there's a difference between going to war and committing murder. 
So those are some things that the Bible or this commandment does not forbid. So what does it for, forbid? What, what is it actually saying, thou shalt not kill? What's it saying to us? First of all, it forbids intentional killing. And the first thing I think about is homicide there. Intentional killing. Approximately 26,300 are murdered in America every year. That's about two to three people every hour of every day. That's staggering, isn't it? Homicide is a crime against society. It is a crime against the individual. It is a crime against their families. It is a crime against God who gave that life. In Genesis chapter 6, verse 13, God said to Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence. And you know what Jesus said? As it was in the days of Noah, all right, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Folks, we are seeing an ever-increasing uptick in violence around the world, murdering people, people killing other people and not even thinking about it. It means nothing. If you got something I want, I will kill you for it, and I won't think twice for it. I remember there was a gang used to be in California years ago. This was when I was a teenager. I can't imagine what things are like now, but they called them the snake eyes. And it's because that, that the police there said that when they would look into the eyes of these individuals when they were caught, it was like looking into the eyes of someone with no conscience. They were so cold and so stilly, they didn't care what kind of crime. Can you imagine how much things have gotten worse since then? Also think about suicide. It falls in this category. Suicide is also intentional killing. Every year in America, 400,000 people attempt to take their own life. 30,000 succeed. The Bible teaches us that no one has the right to take their own life because they didn't create their own life. God gave them that life. And when God gets ready to take our life, he'll, he'll take it, and he'll take us home. Folks will say, well, I'm just going to end it all. That's not true. It doesn't end there. It doesn't end for the family that's left behind that's picking up the pieces. And it doesn't end for that person that took their life either because they've got to stand before God in eternity. So it doesn't end at all. Folks say, I can't take it anymore. But no matter the pain or the heartache that you may undergo, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, there hath no temptation taken you but such is common to man, but God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that you may be able to bear it. A better plan instead of suicide is to allow God to give you the grace to be able to get you through. Talk to the people in your life that love you and care about you. Don't stay in that situation. Don't feel like that you're the only one. Now, in some cases, I know depression Mental illness comes, it can cloud somebody's thinking, and, and I'm sensitive to that. I've known people that, that have gone through that. But there's a dark cloud hanging over you. Talk to somebody. Talk to God first, and then talk to the friends and the family that's in your life that love you and care about you. There is hope and there is help. Infanticide is also intentional killing. What is infanticide? It's abortion. The killing of babies, that's intentional killing. 1973, our nation made it okay for a mother to take the life of her unborn baby, and tens of millions of babies have died since then. Around a million a year in America. Right at a million a year. That's about 3,000 every day. Folks, our laws make it safer for a darter snail to survive than for an unborn baby. It's a travesty, it's a tragedy. By the way, you'll hear people every once in a while, they'll use this phrase, an unwanted pregnancy. Folks, there is no such thing as an unwanted pregnancy. I just gave you the number out right there, a million babies every year aborted in America. Do you want to know how many adoptive homes there are in America just waiting for a baby to be born? Two million. That means there's two houses, two homes for every baby that's being aborted. There is no such thing as an unwanted pregnancy. But pastor, a woman has the right to her own body. We're not talking about the body of the woman. We're talking about the body of that baby. That unborn child. That's not an it. That's not a fetus. It is a life that was given by God on purpose. 
If God didn't want that child to be born, he would have never allowed that child, that's right, to be conceived. God said in Jeremiah 1, 5, Before I formed thee in the belly, I knew thee, and before thou camest forth out of the womb, I sanctified thee. Sounds like God considers it a life before it's born. 17 days, the baby has new life in its own blood cell. 18 days, the baby has pulsation, which will become the heart. 19 days, the eyes start to develop. 20 days, the foundation for the nervous system is laid out. 24 days, the heart has a regular beat. 28 days, the arms and legs are forming, can grasp objects in his hands. 30 days, one month, regular blood flow and vascular system are there. Eyes and nasal development have begun. 40 days, heart energy output is 20% of that of an adult. 42 days, the skeleton is complete, reflexes are present. 43 days, brainwave patterns can be recorded. In other words, there's thinking going on there. There's thinking in that life. At eight weeks, all organs are functioning. Two months. At nine to ten weeks, baby squints, swallows, sticks out his tongue. Eleven to twelve weeks, arms and legs begin to move. Eighteen weeks, vocal cords are working. They can cry at 18 weeks. Twenty weeks, hair comes on the baby's head. All at 20 weeks, it sounds like a human being to me. And yet we have those today who claim that the baby is not alive until that baby is birthed. That doesn't make any sense to me at all. And we are believing a lie, a lie that's told to us that says that is not a life before birth. There's five reasons why abortion is killing. Number one, the victim is unquestionably innocent. That baby is innocent. That baby didn't have anything to do with it. And yet you're snuffing out that life. Two, the victim is helpless. The baby can't fight back. That baby cannot defend himself. The order to kill comes from the victim's own mother. Number four, it's always a reason, calculated, and intentional act. Isn't that what murder is? An intentional act. And number five, abortion is paid killing. What would you call it? All right, I want to rub Brother Johnny out. All right, I want to get rid of him. So I'm going going to hire Brother Ray. Brother Ray, I just can't do it. I can't pull the trigger. Can you do it? All right, yeah, how much? All right, here's a thousand bucks. All right, I give him a thousand bucks. What's going to happen if all that's found out? Who's going to go to jail? I'm going to go to jail. Brother Ray's going to go to jail. All right? Now, we're not thinking about doing anything. All right? I just want to let you know that. All right? I'm just saying, we don't have any problem coming to that conclusion with people that's already born, right? But it's the same thing with the baby that's unborn. It's the same thing, and it's murder. God says, thou shalt not kill. This commandment also forbids indirect killing. It's possible to be guilty of murder even if you don't pull the trigger. And again, I think about David. David was guilty of murder. He murdered Uriah, but he wasn't on that battlefield. But God held him accountable for that. This type of killing would include the killing of going through uh, the selling of alcohol, the selling of drugs to other folks. That's exactly what drug dealers are doing. Folks who sell alcohol, you're just slowly killing other people. Habakkuk 2.15, we've forgotten this verse. By the way, we've forgotten this verse in churches today. Okay, I want you to listen to me. There are some churches and there are pastors that are getting this wrong. And I want you to hear the truth tonight. Habakkuk 2.15, Woe unto him that giveth his neighbor drink, that putteth thy bottle to him and makest him drunken. Folks, what are we thinking about when we're saying it's okay to drink sometimes? It's okay on certain occasions. Alcohol is wrong on every occasion. But preacher, it's not a sin unless I get drunk. Isn't that what the Bible says? Folks, you're drunk with one drop. It starts altering your body with one drop. We've forgotten that. Or we've at least chosen to ignore it. This type of killing includes drunk driving deaths. 45,000 killed every year. It includes killing the testimony and reputation of other people. Wow, there's one we hadn't thought of. Thou shalt not murder. Can you murder another's reputation? Absolutely, you can. You can kill another person's name, and you're breaking the commandment when you do. Some kids are killing their parents slowly by the poor choices that they're making. Some are killing their marriage partner by not treating them right. 
Finally, this commandment also forbids inward killing. Listen to what Jesus said about this commandment. Matthew 5, 5 verses 21 and 22. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Now, he's going back to the Ten Commandments. This very same commandment that we're talking about tonight. He says, thou shalt not kill. And whosoever shall kill shall be in danger of the judgment. God will hold you accountable if you murder somebody. That's what he's saying. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. In other words, God's going to hold me just as accountable if I hold anger in my heart toward another as he would as if I went out to kill somebody. And I know the consequences are different. But I'm going to still be held accountable because both is sin. That's what Jesus is saying. You see, it all starts with the thinking. It moves to the talking. The next step is the deed. Jesus said it comes from the heart, Mark chapter 7. For from, from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulterers, fornications, murders, and the list goes on from there. 1 John 3, 15. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. I think there's a lot of folks, even folks who claim to be Christians today, who are carrying around baggage of having ill feelings toward another person. It may even be another brother and sister in the family of God. Ill feelings toward another. What we need to do is to go make it right if we can. To do our best. We may have, we may have been the one that was hurt, but we go make it right if we can. Some folks just don't want to let things go. I heard about a woman who went to the doctor, and the doctor said to her, you got rabies. Now I've got some treatment here. It's a series of shots. I can give those shots to you. They might work. They might not. You might die. And so the woman reaches in her purse, and she takes out a piece of paper, and she begins to write furiously. And the doctor looked at her, and he said, what are you doing? Are you making your will out? She said, no, I'm not. He said, what are you doing? He said, I'm making a list of all the people that I want to bite. You see, some people, some people don't want to let things go, all right? Maybe it's time for us just to forgive people. Wow. That's, that's something, isn't it? Just let it go. You know what? Some people have been mad at other folks for so long they forgot what they were mad about. I remember two sisters years ago, same predicament. They forgot what they had a fallen out. They never would sit with each other in church. I always sat on each, on one on this side and one on this side when they were there at the same time. And they didn't even know what they were mad about. They just knew they were upset. I wonder if we've broken this commandment somewhere along the way. You think we have? I guarantee you, every single one of us here tonight have broken. Thou shalt not kill. I've never murdered anybody. Think about the things that we've talked about tonight. You ever heard somebody's name? You ever murdered somebody's te uh, testimony? Reputation. Three of the greatest men of the Bible. Think about it. Moses, David, and Paul. Now, I would put those three guys up against any three you want to name tonight. All right? Three of the greatest. You know what they had in common? One of the things they had in common? They were all murderers. They all murdered another human being. But you know what they also had in common? They were all forgiven by God for those murders. And God used all three of them. The fact is, we're all murderers. That's the bad news. But the good news is, we can be forgiven. We just ask God to forgive us. And we try to make it right with our fellow man. We have these four little words of us tonight. Thou shalt not kill. They condemn us. Those are condemning words. But then Jesus often spoke four other little words. Thy sins are forgiven and that is the remedy for breaking this commandment tonight it's saying god i'm sorry I, I i shouldn't have thought that about that person i shouldn't have said that about that person i shouldn't have taken that action god forgive me help me to get my heart right and then help me to do what i can to make my relationship right with that other individual let's all stand together tonight <clears throat> Maybe this is one of those commandments that as you go down through the Ten Commandments, you thought maybe, well, I'm, I'm doing all right on that commandment. Maybe the Holy Spirit has spoken to you tonight and said, you know, you're guilty in that area. 
You know, you've got some hard feelings you need to get rid of. You've got some grudges you need to stop holding on to. You need to go make it right with that other person. That person may be in your own household. 